Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Judith. I'm Head of Government Relations and Education and Chair of the BFC Colleges Council. Uh, warm welcome to everyone. This is the first of our events um, for Graduate Preview Day for 2021. Um, we're delighted um, to have you all here. Um, each year, Graduate Preview allows industry professionals access to the top portfolios from the graduating fashion talent that's coming from our UK top fashion colleges. Um, and we're really here to foster that relationship between educators, graduates and the industry. Uh, we're going to put the link to the Graduate Preview website into the chat now so that you can all see it and encourage you to look at the incredible work um, that's coming through this year. As well as profiling the top talent to industry and beyond, the Graduate Preview also runs a series of events to support you, the students, with top tips and knowledge about how to take your next steps into the industry, whether it's insights about that first job or getting advice of how and when to set up a fashion business. Uh, we're hoping today to give you the opportunity to hear from some top industry professionals on the do's and don'ts when taking that first big step into the world of work. Uh, this is a really interactive session, so for those of you who are on the call today with us, um, we welcome your questions, which can be put in the questions box, and we'll be reviewing that. Um, we'll be finishing at half 11, um, the conversation, so that you can start to um, ask your questions. Please do raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question live. We'd love to bring you on camera so that you can ask your, your questions, um, or put them in the chat and I can ask them on your behalf. Um, it would be great to have a, a discussion with, with uh, today's panellists. So without further ado, they are uh, Anna Foster from ELV Denham, who's in conversation with Mima Viglesio. Um, uh, Anna is the founder and creative director of ELV Denham and has worked very closely alongside Mima, who is the editor and broadcaster. Um, and they're going to discuss the importance of collaboration. So without further ado, I'd love to hand over to yourselves, Anna and Mima. Are you ready to take the floor? Thank you. Very ready. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much for your introduction. Hello, everybody. Really happy to be here and honoured, actually, to be part of the first of these, um, you know, occasions. So hi, Anna. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, so just to give a little bit of introduction, Anna and I uh, actually collaborated before uh, when we had we launching Lula magazine. So I was the editor, Anna was the fashion director, and we had these two years together where we started understanding each other and, and, and that then became a, I hope, forever very good friendship. So when Anna came up with this amazing idea of ELV Denim and a sustainable uh, denim brand, we didn't really decide to collaborate. And, and, and what happened is that nothing really happened ever officially. So I don't have an official role. I'm not an investor. I'm just a friend with a different set of skills. And so almost, I guess, and Anna, correct me if I'm wrong, but naturally, we starting in a way uh, working together on this when it was necessary. I mean, full disclosure, I'm, I call myself now an editor and a broadcaster because that's what I do the most, but my career was in fashion. I've always been a communicator and I have been for the past 10 years a consultant with startups. So all of this came handy with Anna and, and, and our own brand. So just to you know uh, give a start to this, what does it take, Anna, to be an entrepreneur in a quite lonely way, so alone? And how did, did it happen that you reached out and you contacted me to help in the business side of the business, of, of, of the company? Well, I think I'm, I'm a very kind of, I think I'm a very open person. I discuss lots with people. And I think when you are bouncing ideas off originally, I think it's really good to get a broad section of feedback of what you're planning on doing, how you're planning on doing it. And I remember sitting with you in Paradigm, I think it was, in King's Cross, and we were just chatting about lots of kind of concepts. And then you can be quite tunnel vision when you have a bit, when an idea, a brand, and how you want it to be aesthetically, how you want it to be, what your ethos is. 
but then you've got the reality side of things, haven't you? And be, having been a stylist for 20 years, I worked for lots of young brands when they came out of college as their stylists, as a, you know, working with them, kind of, you know, curating their collections when they wanted to present it for the first time. And what I was always mm. a, kind of astounded by is that maybe they didn't have kind of business acumen it brought into it so it's actually you have you you come out of college I can imagine and it's you have all these amazing ideas but sometimes you need someone not to kind of dampen those ideas but really just channel it or to say have you thought about how that can be commercially viable and that's what I think is drew me to you on this front you know we had worked together on much more of a creative level um and I guess I hadn't probably tapped into those really kind of commercial business orientated ideas because we'd never really discussed them as much and then yeah. with your experience working at the Gucci group and Louis Vuitton and all those opportunities you were able to kind of I guess not not lecture or kind of tell you but actually say well this is what happened in this time and by having those conversations we were able to maybe take some advice or experience that you'd had in a different part of your life and apply it to what I was wanting to do. Um, and I mean, I think I've, have I always taken your advice? Have I ever not taken your advice? <laughs> but you know, I, I, want, I want to say something here because I'm thinking of the audience we have yeah. and the students. So in my last uh, corporate job, when I was at the, at the then Gucci group now caring, I was in a way, it happened also quite spontaneously, but the link between the CEOs of the brands and their creative directors, because as everybody knows, sometimes creative directors are, as the word say, creative, and they don't understand why they're not given millions to do a campaign when, et cetera, et cetera. And so for some reasons, I was the link because having some creativity in me, but also some business acumen, I spoke their language. And that's why I guess, Anna, with you, it happened naturally. We did something creative together. We redesigned and relaunched a magazine, but then you found out that I could also tell you, no, hold on, yeah, hold like, on a second. I what about the scalability you know. of the business? What about the business plan? You cannot do it like this, right? Yeah, because I think if you come for something when you were, from my side, you were creative. So I always knew you had that in your mind as well, that you weren't just, going, oh, you've got to do Excel spreadsheets, you've got to think about your cash flow. It, because you weren't, well, yeah. you, you weren't the single minded in that. I knew that you understood the vision that I wanted to do. And sometimes, sometimes it doesn't make, you have to have, you have to kind of marry those two things. You have to understand that fashion is ultimately what you want to be as a business. So you have to have someone guiding you along that route. But you can't just be single minded in that group otherwise you don't achieve your vision so but knowing that you had two sides of your ability Brain. made me because sometimes I do have someone that helps me in my fat and I'm like oh no you don't understand you don't understand because you just automatically think that's wrong but actually I think being a successful designer a successful creative director means that you are open to other people's ideas you might go there and then come back to what you originally wanted, but I think it's so important to listen and try and not think from the outset, oh, this is a wrong, this is a waste of time, because you always learn something on the way, you always do. Even if it's learning what you don't want to do, you always learn something from your mistakes, someone else's mistakes, and those are the things that really build strong foundations. I really believe that. I do, I do. You said something very interesting because no matter how, how close a friend you are and how you understand each other's skills, but then you also have to believe in, in, in the vision and in the project. So I cannot, I could not work with you if you were doing the least sustainable denim brand, because for me uh, today, making, you know, creating something that also talks to the needs for the environment or human rights is, is essential. I wouldn't want to work with someone who just launched a brand for its sake. Mm -hmm. And so that was a lucky, 
encounter, but maybe that's why also we became friends because we have the same values. But um, I think it would be interesting for the students to hear what, what it took to go from an idea to a company because you launched an idea and now you're scarily successful in your, in your brand. And, and it's what, two years, three years? Not three even three years, years three right? Years now, yeah. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? I think it would be interesting to hear. I mean, I think it started actually having said things like you don't want to make mistakes or, you know, I was very conscious of having a am limited amount of money that I had to put into the business in the first place. And I didn't, I never wanted to get to the point where I was going backwards and backwards, you know, the point of zero of actually, of course, you didn't, you don't expect to make money at the beginning, but you have to think, if I'm going to be 20,000 pounds in debt at the end of my first year, this is not going to work. It's from, so that's, that's a good thought because not everybody thinks like that, but go on. Yes, <laughs> Very good. No, exactly. But I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to have that in my mind. And I think it was slowly, surely taking really kind of baby steps. And because I, because I come from a completely different point, I haven't, didn't graduate in fashion design from college. So I came from, I guess from a different point of view, I knew my experience of what other people had been through. So I knew I had to kind of, you get to a certain stage, you make sure that everything that you've learned from is solid. And only when you've achieved that and you've succeeded on that level. So say I started my, I launched with one gene. So once that was successful and I literally, I could do it my eyes closed, I then did my next one. And I know that's not always the case for a ready to wear brand when you have to create collections. But I'd, in my experience, I'd seen young designers create a whole new collection and then start a whole new collection the next season. And when you don't have the financial stability necessarily to invest in new patterns, materials, it seemed sensible to work on what you had originally as the base and make those tweaks. So, and I was able to create two new jeans based on the first gene, if that makes sense. Um, and so if you're thinking about on a scale level, I just, I, I think it, for me, it was not having too much waste from a material point of view and also from a business point of view. I didn't want anything to go to be just like, oh, that will never work. Or I, I wanted to be able to sell that eventually because you have to make money so you can, you can do the next part. And having everything going around in the background and I guess it's all about spinning plates. And it's also having people around you to help you support that spin those plates. Um, you've got the creative side, you've got the business side, and I think you've, then you've got the idea of building your future as well. So it's like three points, and you always you have to make sure that those three things grow at the same time, because if you, you know, if you're just concentrating on building your design, but you're not concentrating on your business plan, and you're not concentrating on what you're going to do next, those. God, I wish I had a flow diagram. But your creativity can be up here but if you're not supporting those two other parts it falls down that's from so, that so like, are, you, are you saying what i believe in that creativity if it's not relevant to anybody it doesn't matter is that what you're saying meaning i, I think you always have to have an art, so it needs to be selling right yeah you have to be selling you have to have an eye on what's going on which is always not very easy because you can sometimes get so down a rabbit hole of what you're doing you have to not, you know, I know you've said to me, oh, so-and-so is doing this. I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter. I don't mind. But you have to kind of have an eye on the world, what's happening, being able to kind of, and then also it helps you collaborate sometimes with another creative brand, not necessarily collaborating with a business mind or someone else that's helping with your business. It just, you know, some of the most exciting projects I've done is from communicating with other brands and seeing where you can share resources or share ideas. Um, and it's very hard right now because we don't get to have that face-to-face. -face. And I do miss that. And I think anyone coming through now is, it's trying to get that face-to-face -face time with someone. You know, Zoom meetings do facilitate, facilitate um, a, they help with a problem that we have right now. But, you know, I see someone I haven't seen for ages on a, from a creative level. It's literally like you can't, wait to talk to someone because those ideas you can have literally a conversation with them for five minutes and you the the outcome of that is so much more than it would be on having a zoom call 
but I just I so what I'm trying to say is I think that you're right I think that it you have to have all parts working at the same time of course some creative activity has a jump and then but then you've got to think about your business plan you've got to think about um growing and where you see your vision in a year's time two years time like it's hard to do that I struggle you always say to me what's your you know what's your five-year plan I'm like oh my god I don't know what my five-year plan is I think when you want thing, I think I think and tell me if you agree that you did that after years of experience yeah. in a job after being a mother and building a family and so I'm not I don't mean by this that you're old but you're older than most of the students no, yeah, that start yeah, yeah, the I day do. after left uni and so don't you think that that's not easier but I mean when you say you know you have to have a vision and a creativity and that was my idea but you also have to have or find the way to do a business plan etc but all of that and when you say I didn't want to be 20 million in debt after the first year or sorry 20 million yeah, 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. in debt after the first term etc etc but when you're 22 and you have great ideas I mean I work with students and yeah you know, and I've seen some of the things I've looked at the preview and it's incredible some of the work what? Amazing. what do they have to do you know they're not 40 years old they don't have kids they don't have a family budget they haven't been around and seen you know we've seen the magazine we've done together we've seen what happened there so how how I mean what could, how do they need to collaborate with someone because someone else will talk about collaborating with other brands and so collaborating on a creative side yeah. we are talking here about finding the balance between you know the business not killing your idea and that's what you and I have start you know I've tried doing since the beginning but still making it relevant and scalable so do you think that being a little bit older and a little bit more experienced helped I, I think definitely I mean my, I remember well in another past life I really you know I left school and I went to I went, went to be a dancer I went to the Laban Center and I just thought I knew it all Honestly, I thought I was, I knew everything. And after my first year of da dance college, I dropped out because I didn't have the, I had the vision about what I wanted to be a dance, but I didn't think about the training. I didn't have that whole kind of 360 determination that you needed. And some of the girls that were much older than boys that were older than me, they'd been, they'd experienced and they knew, and they had a much of a stronger vision what they wanted to do. So I think I was naive in, in my approach in certain ways. And so I took a step back um, and then I ended up in fashion eventually anyway, uh, eventually up in fashion, not being a dancer. But what I'm trying to say is that I think you can make rash decisions as a young person. So I know that coming to my experience now with my business, that I look at it in a very methodical way a lot of the time. And I guess I cannot really kind of talk enough about how important seeking advice is from other people outside the industry, whether they, they don't have to be in the fashion industry to understand cash flow or just keeping a chart of your accounts. I mean, I think even just having an envelope, you put all your receipts in at the end of the month and then totting them up because I mean, I know it sounds really basic, but even as a stylist, as a, you know, an assistant, and when I started myself, I'd put all my receipts and, you know, on a Sunday night at the end of the month, I would put them all together and go, okay, need to kind of cut back on that. Because it's, and it's just, you might, you know, speaking to my dad, who had no idea about fashion industry, but he came from a different point of view. And I think just talking to people and talking to people that you believe have an area of expertise, not in your not in your field it doesn't really matter because collaboration with someone's point of view can always benefit your vision it's yeah it, it's very hard because i know that i'm talking from a lot of experience and i'm talking about when i was a dancer at 18 because that's the only time i can remember kind of going into something literally feet first and not really thinking about the bigger picture um and I think you have to have a very good point of view. I think you have to have to find what your what point of view makes you different from other people. Um, and that I know that's not an easy 
that's not easy to do but you know having your vision and believing where you're going but having you know I, I just think advice is key it doesn't take a lot to kind of talk to people and 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 what about I'd like to talk a little bit about creative collaboration because I don't know if our audience knows but um you created this hashtag ELV then in family so mm -hmm. it's the people you are surrounded by they can be real family so black family or family you know as you call it your friends the people you admire the people that inspire you and and you do campaigns with them um so is that a creative collaboration i mean do you listen to their feedback they they and i can say i because i was very lucky to be in the first year with family but i mean do they wear your jeans do they believe in what you're doing for the denim industry i mean talk about a little bit about the creative um yeah so, side of the so i mean literally as i say you know i do talk a lot to people um and everybody in my campaign is someone that i really value their advice i do take their advice um i you know just for example my sister's in my new campaign and my sister and i couldn't be further apart when it comes to kind of personalities um, and she's very sensible uh, but she loves the jeans and she loves what I'm doing and you know we're, we're launching her picture this week and you know everyone else kind of you know wrote all these long you know talking about you know, how much they admired the you know the concept and they loved the jeans my sister was like I have a very different attitude to clothes I'm practical that you know and she heard that's really just that describes her, but knowing that she who isn't necessarily someone that's into fashion as a trend, she just wears clothes for practical reasons, she loves the jeans. So getting her feedback, getting feedback from customers, uh, from clients. I had a client that was in my campaign because she was my first ever client and having her direct feedback is, you don't always want to hear it, not always, but sometimes that just makes you consider design tweaks or designs that perhaps you wouldn't have done before even if it just brings the question of you know I get asked all the time about adding stretch into the denim because of vintage jeans and I just and I think about it a lot but every time I think well no because stretch eventually is going to stretch out of shape that's by definition of what it says it does so I always think about that and then I go back and I was like no but I do consider it because I think you have to really consider feedback all the time because otherwise you'll never grow as a business you'd always be single-minded but lots of the other people i'm just looking around at them now um you know they are they're sounding blocks i guess and they're sounding blocks because it means that you can listen to them you can decide whether you want to take on their advice or you can kind of park their advice for another opportunity i guess and then you're what, what's the what's the line between getting a feedback on board and one not and by that i mean even you know you and i had this discussion in in the business but sometimes someone gives you feedback and you know that that's wrong you know you know sometimes i know sometimes i doubt and sometimes i'm stubborn but sometimes i know that i know better so how do you deal with it <laughs> you ask for a second advice i mean you and i had some differences in our yeah. collaboration and then sometimes i'm like Anna, i know that's wrong and sometimes i'm like oh i'm sorry you were right rarely but it can happen right? <laughs> <laughs> no I, I guess it does i mean i'll be you know sometimes i always think if you yes so say you told me a, some advice about something you wanted to do so because so, it's sometimes with language isn't it that you and i may be kind of have disagreed because you have a certain language that grammatically and i like to speak as i sound um and sometimes it works so yeah yeah so sometimes it works so sometimes when you're doing a press release you're like no you've got to do it like this but when it's when we've been talking about all the new elb family people and they've been writing questions and we've been having conversations we agreed to keep the language as I would have it, the way I talk and the way they talk. So, you know, I think you understood how, what, what I wanted to do in that point. And even though inside you're going, but it's not grammatically correct, you understand. <laughs> you understand that that's my vision and how I want it to come across. Otherwise, it isn't me anymore. Yeah, and yeah that, that's a 
one, but like for instance, the stretch thing, you know, yeah. some people would tell you, as you said, you need to do this and that because of the commerce and whatever. And you yeah. once told me, but it's wrong because it's not sustainable or because it doesn't keep the shape. So what I'm trying to say here, and it's not a question, this is something I think that in everything, in life, in business, in whatever, sometimes you know you're right and 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 the future will prove you right and so sometimes you just say no but also, not taking but this also like, sometimes you have to think but i also i think sometimes even though i know that stretch isn't right i know that it goes against but because we're gonna eventually i'm thinking in the back of my mind do i need to start bringing in stretch because the amount of stretch denim that gets chucked into landfill is absolutely humongous. And so we need to find a solution yeah, for that well, problem. I mean, but therefore, I have a little kind of little thing in my head going, waste, stretch, stretch, stretch all the time. And then maybe I will have to kind of address that, but but it will be because it will be a necessity, I guess. Because that's what I want this business to do. I think I want, I always design from a point of waste. And if at one point waste is all that stretch, then you have to kind of deal with it then. Um, so yeah. are you finding a solution? I'm thinking about- Are you finding something that can help you? I'm- at the not, Are you collaborating? Sorry? Are you finding someone who can help you finding a solution on this? Yes. I mean, yes, we've got, I've got lots of, it might not become jeans, but it's going to come into something eventually. Um, and I think that's also another side of the business is that I'm, as as I as you as I think as one goes into further what their vision is. Sometimes you find that a side of your business might not be creating jeans. It might be creating a solution to a problem that has a link to your business, but isn't actually. It's just in the world of fashion, it's the world of material and the world of environmental consciousness um, without giving too much away. <laughs> I was trying, I was trying to get a scoop here. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I see, I'm, I'm conscious about time, but because um, maybe my next question would be a little bit long, but let's try before the, yeah. the, the questions from the students. You said it at the beginning when you were saying, you know, I came out of college and I had no idea about business and whatever. I had ideas, I had things I wanted to do. And, you know, in my sometimes speaking with students in schools or even teaching, one of the things that I'm asked most of the time is, how is it then out in real life? You know, we, we are pushed to be creative. We are taught techniques in any type of you know artistic endeavor but then we don't know about real life and so most of the time since I have had this career in, in, in corporate life I'm asked to teach that and it's not really teaching it's explaining you know so do you think that that they would be needed in school do you think that it would help students to be better entrepreneur in their endeavors if they were taught about you know, reality, hundred business. I think Is there anything you learn that you would like them to be taught. I mean, I think it's, I think it's definitely about having a cash flow process. I think that business is really important mm -hmm. because, and I, God, and I just, I hope there are no kind of creators of curators of the examples on here because I really think it's important to teach business of fashion and business of design with it, whether it becomes a different option that people can you know, a, a module that people can add on to their class, because I can understand you get taught so much that you need to learn in those three, four years. Um, but having an option to be able to, or have mentors that are in the college, people like yourselves, of course, that do, that there can be someone to give you, I don't know, a bit like a welcome pack, for, a welcome pack, a, you know, welcome pack for design, you know, when you join, the, I don't know, when you join any, when you join a bank and you open a bank account, you get a welcome pack, which you probably never read. But in this case, you would read that and it would say, here's a basic cash flow template. Here is, you know, assessing everything, give yourself a checklist. And I think if you kind of set those corner, those kind of uh, boundaries and those foundations, it doesn't have to be a lot. I'm not saying that you have to focus 50% of your time on this, not, but if you just give yourself those tasks and you tick them every month, 
I really think you have a better understanding of where you're going. Or if you have an option to buy a load of material because it's come up and you think, actually, no, I, 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 can, I can do that because sometimes you have an opportunity that won't come around again. Um, but also it could be that you have two opportunities that month. And I've had it when I'm like, I would love to take this now, but I don't have the storage. And yes, it, sometimes it's annoying you couldn't. I had an opportunity to take a whole pile of denim, but I couldn't put it anywhere. I really couldn't store it. And, um, and then I lost that opportunity. And then I, I do wish I'd taken that up, but it's, I couldn't afford it. And if I had done that done, I might not have been in this position now because, so you always have to weigh up whether it's worth it or not. But cash flow, you know, basic accounting, I think would be really good. And I know there are people out there that are able to advise and I know the BFC have a load of teams. Sorry, I'm now putting it back on you guys. <laughs> well, thank you for, for, for your honesty, both of you, for, for, for being sort of so transparent about your relationship. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, don't want, I don't want it. I feel like we're sounding like, you know, you ha always have to have like kind of business, you know, you have to focus, focus, focus on your, of course you don't. If we're making it sound a bit dram dramatic than that. I also collaborate with people that are much more kind of, they're on the creative side, photographers, art directors, because again, you have such a vision that sometimes you do need someone telling you or kind of helping you hone that um, as well, because, you know, that's why I used to be a stylist for designers as well, because you help, you help kind of focus what they're doing. I was going to actually ask you, I'm going to encourage everyone to, to put questions in the chat, but that was going to be one of my questions to you, Anna, because mm. imagine collaboration can be across all different areas, can't it? And um, so how, how do you identify where you need that, those, those kind of collaborators? How have you kind of gone about that? Well, I think, you know, I think for me, because being, and I do have this, I have this quandary in my head all the time, because I came from a certain aesthetic background where it might not be so commercially viable, but then I've also got to realize that I have a denim brand and denim is a very commercial item. So I have to have some image, so the, all the imagery that I have to convey, I never want it to isolate anybody particularly because, <coughs> But then the side of my side, then I, you know, I collaborated with Display Copy recently, which is a magazine based out in, the, in New York, and their images were just utterly beautiful. And if I could create all those images all the time like that, I would, but I know it would not really talk to a lot of my people that buy my jeans. Mm -hmm. So I think it's sometimes working with stylists or art directors that have that kind of connection with with your I guess your top vision of how you'd want your jeans to be and yeah. then dotting those in occasionally amongst the campaign imagery and the imagery that you know speaks to lots of people and I yeah. think just not it's sometimes getting that balance is really is a fine balance and can I ask you Mima because I imagine as the collaborator um imagine a lot of people turn to you for support. So how do you decide, is this a bit mean? How do you decide who you want to help and who you want to get involved with? <laughs> it's a very, very good question because I do receive, you have no idea sometimes I receive. So I'm glad to be in the, in the eye of young people because they are the one I want to work with, but I receive photos of potential collections that are like disaster. And so the first thing I tell people I'm brutally honest. So I will work with you for money or for free because it's not always for money if I believe in what you do. So that's for me, it's the only thing. Yeah. I have, first of all, to think that your product or idea or whatever it is, he's, follows my values, is original, so beautiful, it's a bit subjective, but I mean, has, has, some legs you know can go somewhere because of its originality needed whatever and if i like you as a person because i've had even bigger brands that were paying better but then the people would pay you not to listen to you so i've had i'm not mentioning names but a big brand where they were asking me in a meeting and then to explain to me things and why? i mean if you know it all why so Short answer is I have to believe in who you are, yeah. what you're doing and why. 
but I think not, you know, it, 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 it is subjective, isn't it? Because also it could be that Mimi, you don't like it, but the next person will, because otherwise if we all like the same thing, it would be a disaster. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's always going to be Yeah. Yeah, but hold on, it's not a subjective liking because in my career I also learn to make a difference between what I would wear or do or okay, yeah. want and what makes sense in the world. So that it's not subjective, you know, but there are things that I know because I am, you know, experienced that yeah. will not go anywhere. Yeah. And so I wouldn't. I'm, I'm going to bring on a student, Franco, who I know and I hope doesn't mind just being straight on because <laughs> we have a question from Franco. Are you there? This is always a bit of the Eurovision moment, whether you <laughs> can get the person on successfully. It's a really interesting question, actually, Franco, so I'm happy yeah. to answer that. Oh, I haven't seen it. Hello, Franco. Hello. 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 How are you? <laughs> Hello, Franco. It would be nice to see your face. Yeah. Oh, oh, hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. hi. How are you? Um, Franco's question, Mima, is kind of the coronavirus pandemic has made finding work experience and context challenging. How do you plan on approaching the industry in this new context? I totally understand. I mean, we have people asking to do work experience with us all the time. But, and I do understand this. The trouble is, is that you're, I didn't, and I didn't realize we made a mistake. I'll be completely honest. We took on a work experience person that was a graduate by accident because we didn't, I didn't know that you aren't allowed to do that. Um, and so someone very kindly pointed it out to me. Um, and because I guess, you know, you have lots of brands that would exploit your degree and your graduate, but then how do you, then undergraduates come to you for work experience. We've taken on an undergraduate in, um, in as part of their course, but I do understand it's such a, a, it's so difficult because you've got brands that would love to take you on for a little bit, but they can't afford to take you on. And then you want to do the experience and you're happy. To, so it's, I guess it's, but then you've got so many chance opportunity. Well, you've had so many experiences where post-grads come in and then they get completely exploited by brands working for a year, two years. So I know that's what we're trying to stop, but I, you know, maybe Mima, Judith, you have, because I, I, I do, I see so many people I, who are amazing and I'm like, I'd love to take you on, but I can't afford to. Well, Franco, if we were just you and me uh, in front of a coffee, I would probably be less diplomatic that I will have to be here. But I'm a little bit, I mean, I've seen so many brands interviewing young, just graduate people like five times for an unpaid internship and then telling them, actually, your CV is not really what I need. And I'm like, I'm working for free to learn and you're telling me that I'm not the right person. So I'm really angry with the fact that, as Anna said, some people work for a year for free. So I think here government should come in and really check on regulations, because I do believe that if you happen to be hired for an internship of two, mind, two months by someone like Anna or other good people I know or me, then we would teach you something. Yeah, we would really, you know, it will serve you and we will get from you because I always learn from you guys, but we will give you as much as we can. Two months, three months, boom, you know, and then maybe oh. you get even yeah. higher because you're good. But, oh, but when it, you found it, Frank. Sorry, Mima. Sorry, Judy. I was going to say, Franco, how have you found it um, trying to get your contacts, especially at the moment? What What have you been doing to so like um, after graduate? Um, how's it I've been sending like a bunch of emails out, like yeah. uh, for jobs or internship, and they are all coming to me back saying maybe I've not got enough experience during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and I was just like, unfortunately, like I couldn't go to do my internship because of the pandemic so I've been working like in retail and trying to like do my graduate collection but yeah so like that's why I'm just like trying to like get anywhere that I could um, get yeah. from that to just get yeah. experience and later on see what you might have in the future. And just don't forget that any experience that you have, particularly if it's in retail, whatever, is still showing skills that will be needed by these fashion brands. So just really big those up, you know, that you've seen customers, you understand customers, et cetera, you know, make sure you're really highlighting 
where you've got limited experience really highlight to that brand the things that they would be interested in from from that experience and I just wanted to mention to anyone on the call we do have um, a best practice guide online about internships so do do have a look at that but appreciate that it's it's very challenging Anna Meme have you got any other ideas of of what what would you look for? I have a question for you, Judith. How can a newly graduate have experience at all? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, when I was in uni, I was teaching Italian to French speaking <laughs> students or, you know, it was a totally different experience or yeah. I was waiting in a cafe to make some money, but how can... I, I mean, think, I think it's, like, it's like I just said, I think it's about highlighting an, any experience that you've had, whether it's totally related to the job you're applying for or totally not because you know it's like making a career change isn't it working in a different industry if you can highlight the skills and 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 things that you feel that are relevant and what your ambitions are and where you want to go so any job has has basic skills that any employer is looking for and if you're showing that that you're keen and, and that you have a good work ethic and then demonstrating some of the knowledge that you've gained and some of the skills that you've gained from other work. I think that's that's the key to just really kind of tailor it to whoever. Well, I, always, I always tell people to put in their CV things that are a little bit different than what everybody puts, true. like I like cinema exactly. traveling. But I mean, if you created, I don't know, a little, uh, magazine when you were in elementary school yeah, shows it. that you have ideas to be the leader of the students, uh, professor, whatever team in uni means you're a lead. You know what I mean? I think I, that's what I look for because it's more interesting. Everybody. It might actually be more interesting to employer that you have come through a different route and seen and done different things. That yes. might be. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's what happened to me when I was, I left. I went to uni, did a completely different job, and then I happened to do work experience at ID magazine. And that's and Jane Howe came in looking for a stylist. And because I was so organized, that's why she took me on. Because Fiona Della Negra at ID was like saying, You can have Anna, but you can't have her for two months because she's really amazing and she's really organized. <laughs> Jane literally took me that day. I had no experience in styling whatsoever apart from being in a magazine for two weeks. But I think if you show that you're indispensable, you know, you want to make yourself really hard I mean that's what I did. I worked I was working I was doing two jobs and working as a, a style as an assistant stylist to earn money so I literally worked seven days a week from eight in the morning till set well seven and then in a pub in the evenings <sighs> and if you can show your determination and that was years yeah. ago when there weren't so many people in the industry yeah. but I just think you've got to show your determination because and I always said that to people that wanted to work in magazines and if someone's in that cupboard I know it's not really interesting being in a fashion cupboard. It feels like you're slave labor, but you're learning where all the samples are coming in and out of. You know what PR agency looks after what brand. So if, so, if you know, what happened with Jane? She came on going, oh, I'm looking, and I was able to say, oh, I know, I know, because I returned something that, that last week. And she, yeah. from that moment, just knowing that I had absorbed all that information, that made her think that I was doing a job that even though I had le less experience, that I would be sitting there at working until one ever to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And I think it first, you know, yeah. it's, it's not always fun, but you always learn. Even if you take a Rolodex from being in the fashion cupboard, but you know that there's a white shirt with, I don't know, embroidery of birds on the shoulder, and that's what a stylist needs. And you can impart that knowledge, then they know that, I know that's a terrible example, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the young people listening know what a Rolodex is. But... <laughs> <laughs> Rolodex, oh my god, sorry. People used to have those. <laughs> Google it. Google a Rolodex. Google it, everyone. It's an antique. <laughs> yeah. If you have a Rolodex, we'll all be really impressed. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much. Franco. Thank you. Thank you, Franco. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're now out of time. I, I can't actually believe how quickly that 45 minutes went. That was just incredible. 
Um, but I'd like to thank you both, Anna and Mima. Thank you so much. We've 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 met each other and worked quite a bit over the last few months, haven't we? With one thing and another, and to have your yeah. support for today um, is really really precious to us. And we appreciate you coming right. here and and telling us um, and giving us some insight. So. Thank you both so much. Um, and I encourage everyone who's on the call to have a look at the Graduate Preview website and have a look at the incredible work that's on there. Um, and our next session is at midday, so enough time to make a cup of tea. For those of you who want to join the, the next session, perhaps um, Dom, if you're on the call, perhaps we could put the link to the, the next um, Zoom call on um, where we have, let me just remind myself, we have Matty Boven in conversation with Mandy Leonard. So uh, thank you both again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hopefully it's not too long till we see each other, hopefully in person. <laughs> thank you. That was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Anna. Thank bye. you. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.